So we are moving forward with our lecture. And we are, today's lecture will be on drawing Dewey structures. A quick recap of the first lecture where we, look, we were introduced to bonding generally. And we saw that the electrons in the valence shell are the only ones that participate in any chemical bonding. And when they participate in bonding, they do so so that the atom will be able to attain an octet. And the L atoms, the electrons attain octets either by sharing electrons, gaining electrons, or losing electrons. And we found out that ionic or electrovalent bonding involves the transfer of electrons from one atom or the other to the other, and usually from the electropositive element to the electronegative element to attain an octet nature or the, of the next noble gas. And the lecture on Wednesday, we looked at covalent bonding, which has to do with sharing of electrons. And when atoms, the electrons are shared between atoms, it is also for the same purpose that they may attain the octet configuration. And towards the end of the lecture, we saw the second type of covalent bonding, which is dative bonding, whereby the two of the two atoms that are bonded together, one of them gives the pair of electrons, while the other one does not have any electron, as in the case of ammonium ion. We were able to also differentiate between bonded share, a bonded electron pair and non-bonding electron pair, which are also called lone pair of electrons. We look at covalency, bond length, bond order. So today we are moving forward and we're drawing Lewis structures. So what are the things we are going to be discussing in this? We are going to be drawing Lewis structures by still following this octet rule. Remember that we talked about when you are drawing um, elements, you only put the dots of the number of electrons that are in the valence shell. For example, sodium, when you draw the Lewis, stru uh, Lewis structure of sodium, you don't put all the 11 electrons on it. Sodium has 11 electrons, but only one valence electron. So just put one dot, and that tells you that that is sodium. We also want to look at how to draw the structures with single bond, double bond, or triple bond. We will equally look at whenever there are, there are sometimes they have isomers, and how do we draw their structures? Then we look at resonance structures, how to calculate formal charges, and we are also looking at the violations of the octet rule. Remember that for every rule, there is always an exception. So that octet rule has some exceptions. And the exceptions are sometimes your molecules may have odd number of electrons. And you know that octets is an even number. So when you have odd number of electrons, definitely you can't form an octet. Some molecules have electron deficiency. They can never form octets. They have fewer than eight electrons between them. So there will be electron deficiency in such, such molecules. Sometimes some molecules are even capable of forming more than four bonds. So these are the exceptions to the octet rule that we'll be seeing in the course of this lecture. So the Lewis, you can see that we call it Lewis structure is with this name, uh, the, the, it was named after the person that proposed this. And in 1916, more than a hundred years ago, G.N. Lewis proposed that atoms combine in order to achieve a more stable electron configuration. And that is where we form the octets because you know that on the periodic table, the most stable elements are the noble gases that have eight valence electrons. So now the maximum stability results when an atom is isoelectronic with a noble gas. So we talked about when you have, for example, sodium is 281, but you know that neon is 28. So when sodium loses one electron, it attains the configuration of neon, which is 28. And that would be, it is going to be Na plus. Similarly for um, fluorine, fluorine has 287 uh, and 27. So when it gains one electron, one electron, it also becomes 28. And that would be the configuration of the next noble gas, which is neon. So at any time there is a bond between two atoms, two electrons are usually involved. And when we're talking about this Lewis structure, we are not talking about ionic bonding. We are focusing now on covalent bonding, whereby electrons are shared between two atoms. So when a covalent bond is formed, a single covalent bond will have an electron pair containing two electrons. 
when a double covalent bond is formed, there will be four electrons are involved. When a triple covalent bond is formed, six electrons, uh, uh, three pairs of electrons and six electrons are involved. So in drawing covalent uh, Lewis structures, we use what we call the dots. And that dot, like I said, is only applicable to the valence electrons. So the dots, for example, sodium will have one dot. Let me ask you now for calcium, how many dots will calcium have? How many dots will calcium have? You can type in the chat box. How many dots will calcium have in the Lewis structure? Calcium. Nobody's in the chat room. Calcium, yes, it will have two, two electrons because it has two valence states. So when you draw calcium, just put two dots and that will tell you that that is the valence electron. Thank you. So we use the periodic table to determine the number of dots. So you know that group one elements have one valence electron. So all sodium, lithium, potassium will have one dot. Calcium, magnesium, and group two, they will have two dots. Um, beryllium will have three, uh, three uh, boron will have three, carbon will have four, nitrogen will have five, oxygen will have six, fluorine will have seven, neon will have eight. So each of them has the, 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 the group they belong to on the periodic table dictates the number of dots that they have. So it works very well for the first full row on the periodic table. But the second full row, it has some restrictions, and that is when we start talking about the um, the uh, exception to the rule. So now, let's look at this. This is just what I've said before. So the number of valence electrons are represented by dots. Somebody is asking, how do we find valence of transition elements? Remember that transition elements are metallic, and covalent bond is usually between uh, non-metals. So we can't talk of this for covalent bond. We can't talk about transition elements because transition elements are metallic. So we are only in talking more about non, um, we're talking now about non-metals. So that is why we'll be focusing more on non-metals. So looking at this, now you can see group one, you have one dot. Group two, we have two dots. And remember the two dots will not be placed together. You put them singly before you start pairing them up. Group three, we have three, boron and aluminum, you can see. Group four, these are just for the first 20 elements. Carbon, you have four, silicon, you have four. Nitrogen, you know that you pick the five, but one will be paired similarly with phosphorus. Oxygen has six, two will be paired, two others will be single. See that fluorine has seven and neon has eight. And argon. So that is the so your valence number is the same thing as the group they belong to on the periodic table. I hope you understand that. So the Lewis structure now. So the Lewis structure and the um, how we get that. The, the Lewis dot line representations of atoms and molecules. So we can just like we can use the Lewis structure for atoms, we can also use it for molecules. So in the electrons of an atom, we have two types of electrons, which I've said before. We have the core electrons and the valence electrons. Like sodium now, it has a conversion of two, eight, one. So two and eight are the core electrons, while the valence electron is the one. Um, that has the that is the valence shell. So the number of valence electrons is equal to the group number of the elements for the representative element, which you have seen before. So for atoms, the first four dots are displayed around the four sides, as you can see before uh, in the previous slide. So the, for the first four groups, you see the four, they are displayed singly. And if there are more than four electrons, the dots are paired with those already present until an octet is achieved. So you first do it for, uh, for um, nitrogen, for example, you put the, it has five, you just put one, two, three, four, then the fifth one will be paired. For oxygen, one, two, three, four, then you now pair five and six. So you first do them singly before you pair them for those that have more than four valence um, electrons. 
So ionic compounds are produced by the complete transfer of an electron from one atom to other. But like we're saying, for these Lewis compounds, we're going to be looking at covalent compounds where one or more pairs of electrons are shared between two atoms. So covalent bonding and Lewis structures, the covalent bonds that are formed by the sharing of electrons between atoms, and this can, these Lewis structures are only found in molecules that possess covalent bonds. So the bedrock for writing Lewis structures for the first full rule of the periodic table is the octet rule, whereby you have your carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are usually, uh, they are surrounded by eight valence electrons. So you can see now that carbon in our previous slides, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, you can see the number of electrons that surround them. So we use that, but for hydrogen, Hydrogen cannot form an octet. Hydrogen can only form a duplet. So hydrogen can, you can make hydrogen eight. Hydrogen can only be two. Same, same as lithium can only be two. So for hydrogen atoms, the duplet rule is applied. Hydrogen atoms are usually surrounded by two valence electrons, while your carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine will be surrounded by eight valence electrons. So in writing, Lewis structures for compounds. These are the steps that we're going to follow. We first get the skeletal structure of the polyatomic ion or molecule. And we don't only write it for molecules, we also write it for ions. Like maybe you have your SO42 minus, you can write the, draw the Lewis structure. So the skeletal structure of the atom, of, of the ion or the molecule indicates the order in which the atoms are attached to one to another. Let's say we have water, for example, H2O. If somebody can say HHO, another person can say OHH, and somebody can say HOH, but the, there, must be, there must be an order in which the atoms are attached one to the other. So this is the Lewis structure helps us to know the arrangement so that we have the proper one. Just like if you want to draw a human being, for example, you draw a human being, let me try to draw a human being, you know that this is the skeletal structure of human being. You have the head, you have the body, if it's a, maybe it's a, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a boy, the male, you draw the body, you put the legs, he's wearing a shirt. This is the skeletal, trying to draw a skeletal structure. So this is, this is the hand, this is the other hand, this is the leg, and this is the leg. So this, whoever sees this knows that this is a human being. But I know that the, the, the leg, the feet, must be connected to the leg, the leg connected to the shorts and the top and the hand and the head. It would be hard for somebody to draw a human being like this and draw, put this, draw a human being and put the head here. I say, after all, this is a human being, the head can be here. You know that this is wrong. Even though all the parts of the body, you now put one leg at the head, put the other, now put the hand, put the hand, Put the second leg. And I say, but the, all the parts are complete. After all, I'm not missing any parts. But you know that even though the, all the parts are there, they are not correctly linked. So that's the same thing. The Lewis structure helps us. So I think you know you can write water. We know water has two hydrogen atoms and two, one oxygen atom. So we know that water can be drawn this way. You can draw water this way. Because somebody can say, okay, no, my own water will be like this, H, H, the hydrogen will link hydrogen before oxygen is linked. Somebody can say, this is my water. After all, I didn't lose any atom, H2O. And I will say, no, I'm going to write my oxygen first and put my hydrogen to follow. So whoever does this, so doing this now, there'll be confusion because in writing any of these three structures, the two atoms are present, two hydrogen atoms, and one oxygen atom, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom. So to avoid this ambiguity, just like if someone is doing a human being, I say the head is there now, I can put the head anywhere. It's the same thing that you are drawing your atom, your molecule, and the atoms are not linked properly. So what helps us to do this linking is the knowledge of the Lewis structure. 
So when we draw Lewis structure, we'll be able to place the atoms appropriately where they are supposed to be. We'll be able to do that. And in doing that, the first step is that you have to know the central atoms. So the central atoms, when you have the molecule, the first thing you need to do is to identify what or which are the central atoms and which are the terminal atoms. How do we identify the central atom? A central atom is bonded to two or more atoms in the structure. So when you have an atom, when any atom in the structure is bonded to two or more atoms, that is a central atom. And a terminal atom is an atom that is only bonded to one atom. So when it, does, it, can, it, it has only one bond, that is the terminal atom. And when we are writing this skeletal structure, the idea is that every atom must be connected to the rest of the structure by at least one bond. Just like when you draw a human being, the head will not be floating. Every of the parts of the body must link up together. So when we're drawing the skeletal structures also, every of the parts must be linked together. The parts must be linked together. That is what gives us an idea that we okay, have the complete structure of the atom. So I'll go over it again. There must be at least one central atom and at least two terminal atoms. The central atom is that, how do we identify the central atom? The central atom is that atom that is bonded to two or more atoms in the structure. Then the terminal atom is only bonded to one other atom. And when we're writing the skeletal structure, every atom must be connected to one another. So we have some rules that also govern this. So how do we know the number of valence electrons or the bond that the atoms will have? So we have different families of elements on the periodic table. The first family we are looking at are the halogens. The halogens, as we know, they are group seven elements comprising of fluorine, bromine, chlorine, and iodine. They're in group seven. So they have seven valence electrons. So in sharing, anytime you have any of these, I want to form a bond, you can only form one bond. Why is this so? Because it's only one electron they need more to form an octet. So this one cannot be shared by any other atom. So if another atom comes in here, for example, so another atom, let's say we have atom Y. This is an hypothetical atom. It has an electron that it can share with an halogen. So when this happens, the halogen will now be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is why the only bond that the halogen can form most times is a single bond. The one of the chalcogens, the chalcogens are the six elements, oxygen, sulfur. And as we know, they have six valence electrons and they can often, and you can see of these six valence electrons, two are already paired. So this one is already paired and this other one is paired. So oxygen can form two bonds, either one way, this way, links up with an element in the element Y. That same element Y can come with one electron and come with an element um, Z, can form one bond again. So oxygen can form two bonds, that is one, one bond on either side. That would be two bonds. Or oxygen can decide to say, I can form a double bond. Oxygen can form a double bond with an element. Let's assume that this is not there. Let's clean this off. I can't clean this off now, but assuming this is not there. So oxygen can form one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So is that oxygen goes this way, having a double bond? So oxygen can have a double bond, as you can see here, or it has two single bonds on either side. So that is also the two bonds we are talking of for charcoal, sulfur, and oxygen. Is that a double bond or two single bonds? Or oxygen will do this to also attain an octet. And if you look at this, there are two valence electrons, uh, two, uh, four electrons, there one, two, Three, four. So you can see it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here it's one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight. So is it that oxygen forms a double bond with an element? We we'll call this element X. So it comes maybe it comes Z and a Q or Y. So you can form once two single bonds or a double bond. So that is how you know the uh, the type of bonds the charcoal genes can form. Then for nitrogen and phosphorus group five, they can also form three bonds. And as you can see for nitrogen, nitrogen can form a bond this way. You have a nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five. So you can form triple bond. So this is still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But nitrogen can form in some amino compounds can have a double bond here and a single bond here. And you have a lone pair of electrons. And this is still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or you could have sometimes you could have this could be like this, like this, like this. And you have a lone pair one, two. So this is still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So nitrogen will form three. Now let's look at carbon or silicon group four can form four bonds. So carbon can decide to take it this way. We have one, two, three, four. And as you can see, this is, you can look at the electrons. So this is one, two, four, three. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. So let's go back to calcium. I lost, I think my internet is connected with momentary. So let's look at calcium, um, carbon and silicon. So look at carbon and silicon. So carbon this way. So carbon can have four electrons, one, I mean four bonds, two, three, four. And if you can't see, these are the electrons. The carbon has four, Valence electron originally one, two. Let me annotate with another color. So we we'll have one, two, three, four. So you can form electron with four single bonds. This can be carbon, and that will be an octet. Or you have it, carbon can form a triple bond, as in your ethane, a triple bond, and a single bond. And if you count it also, you are going to have. Eight valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or carbon can also form two double bonds. So carbon can also do this. One, two, three, four. Like in your dying. So you can have one. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six seven, eight. Carbon can also have a double bond and one, two single bonds. So in all, carbon cannot have five bonds surrounding it. Either four single bonds, a triple bond and a, do or a, triple bond and a single bond, two double bonds, or two single bonds and one double bond. So you can't have carbon that will have, did not be one, two, three. Carbon cannot have this. It's not possible for carbon to be surrounded by five bonds. So these are the things, these are the rules that govern our uh, Lewis structure. So once you know this, you will not be, so when you're not drawing your skeletal structure, you won't give more than the necessary number of bonds. So this is a guide to tell us number of bonds that can be formed by these elements. Similarly, hydrogen cannot have more than one bond. Hydrogen can only have, can only have one single bond in hydrogen. You can't have hydrogen that will, hydrogen cannot have double bond. You can't have hydrogen that has connected to two ways. No. Hydrogen has only one valence electron. And so it can only form one bond with any other element that it can join itself with. So these are the rules that will govern what we are talking about. So now, the guidelines in doing this, when compounds are formed, 
they form the octet, they follow the octet rule. And the octet rule says that atoms will share electrons until it is surrounded by eight valence electrons. Atoms will share electrons until surrounded by eight valence electrons. So when you are forming, when you're drawing your um, Lewis structure, every atom in that molecule must have its valence electrons, except hydrogen, which we have said before that hydrogen can only form a single bond. Hydrogen can only form a duplex, so you can't make hydrogen an octet. So what are the rules? We call it the valence shell electron pair repulsion, VSEPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion. We get to that later. So now the Octet rule works mostly for second and um, second period elements. On the periodic table, we have the first period, we have the second period. So the first, the second period, it works well for you. By the time you get to the third um, period on your periodic table, you learn that in your phase one, one, two. The third period, where we now have the D orbital. You know, the first period and the second period, your electrons end either the, the S and P orbitals. That, that's where the electrons are found. By the time you get to the third, up period, that's where you now get the third shell, and that's where you have your D orbital. So there will be some anomalies when you get the D orbital. So now the, um, we'll look at the those that follow the rule before we look at the exceptions. So hydrogen will always have two electrons, as hydrogen will never, never have a double bond because that's only one single uh, valence electron, and that valence electron can be shared with another atom electron to form a single bond. So for hydrogen, for example, we would never have a double bond. So looking at carbon now, you see that carbon has four valence electrons. So carbon can, it has, so the four electrons can come this way, like I've seen, shown you before. So carbon can have four, it can share either ways, two, two. Nitrogen has three unpaired electrons, so it can form three bonds. Carbon has four unpaired electrons can form four bonds, one, two, three, four. The four can be single bond or two double bond or one double bond and two single bonds. Nitrogen has three unpaired electrons. So these three unpaired electrons can form three bonds. Oxygen has two unpaired electrons can form um, just two bonds, either a double bond or two single bonds. And fluorine has one unpaired electron can only form one bond. You can see a double bond between two fluorine atoms or two chlorine atoms. And remember we said in drawing this, we also have what we call the central atom. So hydrogen and fluorine can never be central atoms. The reason why we remember the definition of a central atom is that a central atom is bonded to two or more atoms in the structure. And because hydrogen can only have one bond, it can be bonded to two. Fluorine ions can only have one bond, cannot be bonded to two. So hydrogen and fluorine are always terminal atoms in the structural form that you can never see hydrogen or fluorine as a central atom. Our definition then said that a terminal atom is bonded to only one other atom. So that means that they are, the hydrogen will always be a terminal atom because it's only allowed to form one single bond, while the central atom can be bonded to two or more. So carbon, oxygen can form central atom because they have the capacity to be bonded to any other. So this oxygen can be at the center or carbon can be a central atom. Nitrogen also can be a central atom or fluorine, hydrogen can never be central atom. So let's look at the connectivity now. So we have an example, we have CH2ClF. Looking at this now, carbon, hydrogen, chlorine, fluorine. Fluorine can never, fluorine has only one unpaired, uh, one electron that is not paired in the valence shell. Chlorine has one electron that is not paired in the valence shell. Hydrogen, each of them has one electron. Carbon has four. So carbon becomes the central atom here. In HNO3, nitrogen is there, can form three bonds. So nitrogen can be the central atom. And oxygen can never be. The uh, hydrogen would always be a terminal atom linked to this. So nitrogen has only three. And if you look at it as we were looking at it before, 
we see here that nitrogen can only form three bonds, three single bonds, one, two, three. So that is why this hydrogen cannot come in because if hydrogen comes in, nitrogen will be having um, five valence electrons. Then for carbon, you see carbon also can have four, um, it has four single electrons, so you can form four single bonds. So that's why the other four atoms, two hydrogen atoms will be terminal, the one chlorine and one fluorine. Similarly for nitrogen, it will be central atom, surrounded by the three oxygen atoms. And this hydrogen, you can't bring hydrogen here, you have to bring it here. Looking at this now, you have two carbon atoms. So these two carbon atoms can be central atom. The hydrogen here, the four hydrogen atoms will be terminal atoms. And this carbon, we have the two oxygen. Hydrogen selenide, so selenium is a group two element. So selenium can also be a central atom. H2SO4, sulfur two can, sulfur is the same group as uh, carbon. So you can have four bonds and you now surround the others. Oxygen can be in the zone. Oxygen is the central atom. So we can see, we we'll look at it more. So in general, when there's a single central atom, in the molecule, all the molecules we have, the central atom is the first atom in the chemical formula. So you can see that, that it, uh, if there's a single central atom, it will be the first atom in the chemical formula, NH3, PO43 minus CO2, O3. So this will always be the first atom in the chemical formula. And this can, but there's an exception, except when the first atom of the chemical formula is hydrogen. So like you have H2SO4, hydrogen can never be a central atom. In this case now, like in H2SO4, you can't follow this rule and say hydrogen is a central atom because it's the first atom in the chemical formula. So like I said, for every rule, there is always an exception. So and the exception is when hydrogen or fluorine is the first atom in the formula, it will never be the central atom. So now find the central atom. We have a quiz now. So in the chat box, question one. So in question one, find the central atom in, H, in H2O. Is it hydrogen or oxygen? The central atom in H2O. I said hydrogen can never be central atom. Always listen, always listen. The rule says that hydrogen, when the first atom in the chemical formula is hydrogen or fluorine, hydrogen can never be central atom. And I've done an example before here, H2SO4. You can say that sulfur is a central atom. Okay, everybody, almost everybody got that. Let's look at the second one, SO3. Which one is the central atom? SO3. Sulfur, correct. Beryllium hydride. Beryllium hydride. Beryllium, okay. PCL3, phosphorus trichloride. Phosphorus trichloride, okay. Carbonate. Carbonate, carbon and oxygen. Which one would be the central carbon? Iodates. Iodates. Iodine, correct. Thank you very much. So that ends our exercise. So note the following, still note this. Hydrogen atoms are nearly always terminal atoms. Almost all the time, hydrogen atoms are always terminal atoms because they only form one bond. They can only form a duplex and can only form one bond. So hydrogen is always a terminal atom. In polyatomic molecules, and I'm sure you know what polyatomic means. Polyatomic means you have more than two atoms in the molecule. Your polyatomic atoms are examples of what we have done before. All these are polyatomic. You can see they have more than two atoms in their molecule. They are all polyatomic. So in polyatomic molecules of ions, the central atoms usually have the lowest electronegativity. The lowest electronegativity is usually given, is usually made the um, central atoms, except for hydrogen. We know hydrogen is the, it has very low electronegativity, so we don't count hydrogen. We look at that one. So the poly, in polyatomic molecules or ions, 
the central atoms have the lowest electronegativity. So you only have two atoms that can stand as um, central atoms. The one with the high, lowest electronegativity will be the central atom. In oxo acids, hydrogen atoms are usually bonded to oxygen atoms. So you see in acids, for example, hydrogen is usually bonded to oxygen. So your hydrogen will always be bonded to oxygen. So hydrogen is always bonded. So whenever you have an acid, hydrogen is always bonded to oxygen. With the major exception of carbon compounds, in which long chain of carbon atoms are common, polyatomic molecules, usual and ions form compact structures. You don't want it to be, so maybe you have, um, let me write an example for something of, of that nature. You don't write, let's say you don't write uh, maybe, let's say for this, let's look at this previous example. I want to use that rule for the previous example. Computers and okay. So you don't you form compact structures. Let's look at this example. I'm, I want to illustrate what I mean by that. In this H2SO4, you can see it is a comp you don't write to H2SO4 and do like this and put sulfur, oxygen, oxygen. Now put it, make it a very long chain and put all your four oxygen uh, uh, like this. No, and now put your hydrogen here and put hydrogen. Maybe not put hydrogen here. This is too long. The rule says that what the rule says is that we should make it as compact as possible. So you have to make it a compact um, structure. You try to make it as compact as possible. That is what the rule states. So the rule says that with the major exception of carbon compounds, where you have long chain hydrocarbon, polyatomic molecules usually form compact structures. So steps for writing the structures. Determine the structure. So we want to look at how to write Lewis structures now. How to write Lewis structures. So, number one, you determine the total number of the valence electrons. Determine the total number of valence electrons. That's the first step. So once you write the structures, you have to pay close attention to this step. So one, determine the total number of valence electrons. So let's look at an example of this N2O4. Nitrogen is in group five. So, and there are two atoms of nitrogen. That would be two times five. Oxygen is in group four, has four valence electrons, and there are four of them. Uh, uh, oxygen is in group six, sorry, has six valence electrons, and there are four of them, that is four times six. So N2O4 has 34 valence electrons in the entire molecule. Let's look at the, the anion, NO3 minus. Nitrogen is in group five, one atom of nitrogen, so five valence electrons. Oxygen is in group six, three atoms of oxygen, so that would be three times six, 18. And because it carries a negative charge, negative charge means what? It has gained an electron. Anytime you see negative charge, it has gained, let's like your chloride ion, um, your uh, chloride ion, fluorine ion, oxygen ion, they will be negatively charged. So anytime you see a negative charge, it means it has gained an electron. That would be plus one. So if it is uh, CO2, three, we'll do that later. So when you add this together, that's 24 valence electrons. If it is a cation, like your ammonium ion, it means it has gained, uh, it has lost an electron. So it's going to be five plus four times one minus one. That would be eight valence electrons. So now I want to give you an example of what we do now. So in the chat box, let's do for C O. Three, two, minus. Let's do 
H2SO. So begin to type in your chat box. Um, number total number of valence electrons for CO3 2 minus. Yes, CO2. So people are writing 24. Is that correct? Tony is writing 22. Is that correct? So it's 24. Who is that writing 20? 24. So carbon is in has four billions. The genus is four. Oxygen has six um, uh, valence electrons, and there are three of them, six times three, that is 18. And because it is, it has um, gained two electrons, we add two. And that now gives us 24. So 24 valence electrons. What about H2SO4? So H2SO4, as you can see, is 32. Hydrogen is two. One atom, uh, one valence electron, two atoms of hydrogen. Sulfur is in group um, six. So that will be one, have one sulfur atom. And oxygen is also in group six. And we have four of them, that's 24. The 24 plus eight, that's the 30. So, so now you know how to calculate valence electrons, no, total number of valence electrons. That is how we calculate that. So let's move on. The next or so the first step in writing this structure is determine the total number of valence electrons. So now the next um, rule is that from the chemical formula, determine the atom connectivity for the structure. From the chemical formula, determine the atom connectivity. Connectivity. So I have a formula like, for example, A, B, N. You already know that A is the central atom, and you have n number of B surrounding it. Like you have NH3. You know that N is the central atom surrounded by three hydrogen atoms. NCl3, N is the central atom surrounded by three chlorine atoms. NO2, N is the central atom surrounded by two oxygen atoms. And remember, always remember that hydrogen and fluorine can never be central atoms. Now, when you, after you first, so the first step is calculate the total number of valence electrons. The next one is look at the atom connectivity for the structure. Then number three, you know, the, write the skeletal structure and connect the bonded atoms with an electron pair. So now do the skeletal structure. So for this one, I, I can do this now for my AB. So for that, I can say that, okay, I've determined that A is the central atom surrounded by, let's say I have A, B. Okay, like, let's look at the a, a main example, NH3. So that nitrogen is the central atom. And remember our rule that says that nitrogen can be surrounded by three electron, uh, three bonds. This is my, I'm sorry, I, I won't do that yet. So I just know that nitrogen is my central atom. I will now put my terminal atoms around it. So hydrogen, one hydrogen atom here, another hydrogen atom here, and the third hydrogen atom stays here. So this is just what I need to do. So I will write the skeletal structure, put my central atom at the center, and put the terminal atoms surrounding my central atom. So that is step two we have done, and step three, we now add the dash uh, the um, the bond. We make the bond formation. So the next one is now place electron pair around the terminal atoms so that each atom has an octet. Assign the remaining electrons as lone pairs around the central atom. So now let's look at a typical example. I don't want us to lose these steps. Determine the total number of valence electrons. Uh, determine the atom connectivity by knowing which one is the central atom, which one is the terminal atom. Then you write the skeletal structure and put your dash in between. You place your electron pair 
around your terminal atom so that each atom has an octet. Then you assign the remaining electrons. These steps we will understand it better when we do an example. So let's look at an example. So this is the step, like I said before, you write the you have the molecular formula, you um, sum the valence electrons, you put the electrons around them, and you get a little, little structure. So let's use the example that we have on this slide. This slide is running too fast. So let me put, you have NF3. So the first step is you have determine which one is your uh, your central atom. Remember, we said that fluorine can never be terminal atom. It can never be central atom. So nitrogen, and nitrogen has a lower electronegativity than fluorine. So N is placed at the center, and you surround it by the three fluorine atoms. Then you sum your. We can do this first. Sum your total number of valence electrons. Nitrogen is in group five, and we have one atom of nitrogen that is five electrons. Fluorine is in group seven, and we have three of them, three times seven. So you have 26 valence electrons. Total number of valence electrons is 26. So what we do now from the rule, it says that we should um, give the electron pairs to our, uh, give it make every one of them an octet. So let's start from the central atom. So we have, uh, the terminal atom, sorry. Fluorine is already one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The other fluorine, one, two. So we have one, two. These are the bonded ones. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is another octet. Let's add this other fluorine, one, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So all our terminal atoms are now happy because they are octets. So now, but let's count all the electrons that we have so far. So we have one, two, eight, 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 eight times three, that's what, 24. Now, but the total number of electrons that we have is what, 26. And we've only been able to assign 24. So the rule says that the remaining electrons that are left, we are give them as lone pair of electron on the central atom. So the remaining two now, we now give nitrogen. Because if you look at nitrogen, nitrogen is not happy. Because if you look at this, let me erase this. Nitrogen is, you can see nitrogen is one, two, three, four, five, five, four. Sorry, and then take it eraser. Let me erase this. So if you look at nitrogen, fluorine is happy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This other fluorine is happy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This other fluorine is happy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But let's count for nitrogen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Nitrogen is not happy. And the rule says that they must be octets. But if you count all the electrons you have so far for the terminal atoms, they are 24. But the total number of electrons is 26. So the rule says that if you have extra electrons that have not been used, we'll give our central atom. And when we give these two to nitrogen, nitrogen is now happy. Let's count for nitrogen at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is how we now have a lone pair of electron on it. So this is the Lewis structure for nitrogen. Yes, somebody is raising hand. Okay, let's look at another example. So this is um, CCL2F2. CCL2F2, the least electronegative element here is carbon. How nitrogen got the lone pair? I've already explained before. The nitrogen got the lone pair. The reason why nitrogen has a lone pair is that by the time the rule, if you look at the rule, the, let's go back to the rule. The rule says that the time the total number of valence electron, which we did. So let's look at the rule. The rule says the time the total number of valence electron. And for NF3, nitrogen has five, fluorine has seven times three. That's 21 plus five, 26 valence electrons. 
And the rule says that we should determine the atom connectivity. And it says place electron pair around terminal atoms so that each terminal atom has an octet. So that was what we did. We, we put the electron around the terminal atom. We gave each of them a pair, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have to count this one as well. For this two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight. For this also, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's what the rule says. It now says later that any remaining electron will be given as lone pair to the central atom. By the time we give all the terminal atoms, eight, eight electrons, eight times three is 24. We have a total of 26. So remaining two, the remaining two is given to nitrogen as a lone pair of electron. Who are these writing names now? I've told you don't write any name. I don't want to see any name on matrix number. Simple instruction you don't listen to. So now we have another one. We have CCL2F2. So carbon is the least electronegative element. So it will be the central atom, as you can see. Carbon, we now surround it by two chlorine and two fluorine because these are the terminal atoms. So you calculate the total number of valence electrons. So the total number of valence electrons, calculating that we have 20, 32 valence electrons. Four plus seven times four, that's 28 plus four, that's 32. And the rule says that we should give each of these um, il, um, terminal atoms, we should give them, make them octets. So chlorine will be one, two, three, and give, give them in pairs, four, five, six, and you see now that seven, eight. So that is seven, eight. This also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This also one, two, three, four, five, six. Oops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This other one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These ones can be joined together to form a bond. So this is a bond. Now you can see here now. The bond is here. There's a bond here already. There's a bond here already. So now all our valence electrons, our valence atoms are happy because they are all eight. Eight, eight, eight. So now when you count eight times four, 32, our total number of valence electron is what? 32. So meaning that we are happy, there's no lone pair of electron on carbon. Now let's look at carbon also. Is carbon happy? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Carbon is also happy. The valence electrons are happy, and that is the Lewis structure for that particular compound. So there are times that you could have more than one central atom. Sorry, I lost my screen. So we, there are times you could also have more than one central atom. Let me go back to my slide. So you could have more than one central atom as in the case of this compound. C H four O C H four O that is the C H three O H and so now we know that carbon and oxygen are the central atoms. So you also calculate the total number of valence electrons. You will calculate this to be fourteen. Hydrogen has that one times four. Four hydrogen one carbon atom times four. Oxygen is one times six. That's 14 valence electrons. So you, I know that your hydrogen can never be an oct, uh, octet. So in this case now, your hydrogen has one, two. The other hydrogen has one, two. The other hydrogen has one, two. And this also has one, two. This other one has one, two. So these are eight electrons.
fabric. Uh, so if you count this now, we have um, for carbon, each of the hydrogen is a duplex, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I know that oxygen, we have 14. So the remaining six electrons, we have the remaining one, two, three, four, that is eight. Then you count this one, this is nine, this is 10. So we have 10 electrons that have been given, remaining four. So these four electrons, but if you look at oxygen, oxygen is always have, just having one, two, three, four. So the remaining four electrons will give oxygen as its own pair of electrons. And that now counts for oxygen now. Oxygen now has an octet, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This carbon is also an octet, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the hydrogen has duplets, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And all the 14 valence electrons are fully taken care of. So let's look at multiple bonds. Sometimes, if there are not enough electrons for the central atom to attain an octet, that means that a multiple bond will occur. So far, the one we've looked at are single bonds. There could be multiple bonds. So if the central atom does not have a full octet, change a lone pair on the surrounding atom to another bonding pair to the central atom. So we'll give an example for that. An example for that is uh, your C2H4. So C2H4, let's look, look at the rules. For C2H4, your central atom. So if you look at C2H4, which one is the central atom there? In C2H4, which one is the central atom? Which one is the central atom? Yes, carbon is the central atom. And we have two carbon atoms. So we can write the two carbon atoms as this, C and C, surrounded by four hydrogen atoms, one, two, and you want them to be mirror images of one another. There's another hydrogen atom here, another hydrogen atom here. So let's look at, so let's connect them together. So this connects to this, this connects to this, this connects to this, this connects to this, this connects to this. So now, what is the total number of valence electrons that we have? The total number of valence electrons. The total number of valence electrons. Calculate the total number of valence electrons. Yes, we have 12 valence electrons. Two, the two carbon atoms, four times two, eight, Four hydrogen atoms plus four. That's thank you. So now we need to I, I, I assign, I put the electrons around the valence atoms. Now, do you need to put anything there? Hydrogen is already okay, one bond. So this is one electron here, 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 one electron here. So how many electrons are we assigned now? So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then we count this one, nine, 10. 10 electrons, thank you. So we have two electrons left. We have two electrons left. What do we now do to these two electrons? We can't put one there. And the rule says we should give it, if we put the two electrons here, this carbon will be happy. Let's count for this carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This carbon is happy. Let's put, let's look at this carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is not happy. This is happy. So what do we do? The rule says that if we still have insufficient electrons on one of the central atoms, 
we will now migrate this loan pair and bring it between the two of them. So we put the loan pair here. So this will now become carbon, double bond, carbon, and your two hydrogen atoms, one, two. The other carbon atom, one, two. So now we can see that if we count all the valence electrons, they will be very happy. Let's see. Hydrogen has one, two, one, two, duplets, one, two, duplets, one, two, duplets. Let's count for this carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this carbon is happy. Let's count for this two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is how you form your uh, when you have insufficient ones that is for c2h4 so that's the example that has been done here so you see this no pair of electron what we simply did was we migrated it from here we brought it here and when we brought it here a double bond came in so there's no lone pair again the two of them are sharing the lone pair of electron and in sharing them they are both happy one two three four five six seven eight one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is how we do for that. Let's look at the second exam example, which is uh, the second example is nitrogen. Nitrogen has 10 valence electrons. So maybe I should not even draw it yet. So we have nitrogen and we have two atoms of nitrogen. So nitrogen, nitrogen. So how many valence? This one has five, this has five. So I have five, you have 10 valence electrons. And the rule says we should give each of them a, or a duplex one. So there's a bond between them already. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have 10 electrons. When we look at these 10 electrons, this nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This nitrogen is happy. His other nitrogen friend, one, two, three, four. This is not an octet, it's not happy. So what do we do? We migrate this electron, we bring it here, this pair, we bring it here. We take this also, we bring it here. So at the end of the day, what do you now have? You now have nitrogen, one. I know that nitrogen can have three bonds. So the other nitrogen is there and the lone pair of electrons on each of them. So when you count, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you count for this also, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is how we get double bonds in our Lewis structure. So the double bonds is usually as a result of when the octet, so in this case now, we migrated them here and the two of them have lone pairs of electrons. So that is the end of the class. Sorry that we, our time is fast spent, and the class is coming to an end. So see you next week by the grace of God.